All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host for today's show on human evolution. It is a privilege to have Dr. Jerry Bergman here with me for another important program. As most of you know, this is not Dr. Bergman's first time here on Standing for Truth. He has been here many times in the past. Jerry's been a huge blessing to this ministry. And for his previous programs, please do check the uh, description box of this video, Human Evolution Demolished, and you can find Jerry presenting on topics such as Neanderthals. Uh, Over a year ago, we did a presentation on human evolution. Tonight, we'll have some uh, updates. Looking forward to this, that's for sure. Uh, You'll also find a presentation, God Created the Universe Just for You. And that was uh, a couple months ago. That was a fantastic presentation and discussion. Uh, You'll also find a show on C.S. Lewis, Anti-Evolutionist, as well as uh, Evolutionary Blunders and more. And so before I hand it over to my guest, Jerry, I'd like to give him a proper introduction. Dr. Jerry Bergman has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, biochemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology for over 40 years at several colleges and universities, including Bowling Green State University, Medical College of Ohio, where he was a research associate in experimental pathology, and the University of Toledo. He is a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio, Wayne State University in Detroit, the University of Toledo, and Bowling Green State University. He has over 1,300 publications in 12 languages and 40 books and monographs. I uh, have several of uh, Dr. Bergman's books. I highly recommend them all. And his books and textbooks that include chapters that he authored are in over 1,800 college libraries in 27 countries. So far, over uh, 80,000 copies of the 60 books and monographs that he has authored or co-authored are in print. Dr. Bergman, you're more than qualified to discuss these topics. It's always a pleasure and a blessing, my brother. Uh, Before we get into uh, your presentation tonight, uh, how have you been, Jerry? Uh, Busy. I've had quite a few things. Been doing a lot of speaking have a number of writing assignments that I've had to deal with. So uh, you get some good reviewers and they find some errors in your writing, which is good. Mm -hmm. Rather have friends find them than other people. (laughs) And, uh, and I have to do some uh, revisions. Often it's explaining things in more detail. My reviewers say, look, these people don't have a PhD in microbiology. You got to explain this better. You have to go over this section here in more detail, give more background. So in working with this, I find it very rewarding. I used to spend a lot of time reading, and now I have to spend more time writing because I don't have time to read. Of course, I've done so much reading. In my past, usually I can deal with a writing issue because it's I've got ideas and and, uh, books that I've read that I can at least easily refer to. Well, I appreciate that introduction, uh, Jerry. Endless projects to, to keep you busy. Uh, Again, I've got several of of your books, uh, including a few behind me and your uh, newest one as well. So I do highly recommend them to all of our our viewers. If they want to see more from you, Jerry, in the description box, I do have relevant links to your website. I am always keeping up uh, up to date on your material that you're putting out. And so I know you've put out uh, several articles since the last time you've been here, including articles I believe on AIG, possibly CMI. So Jerry, I appreciate all the work you're doing. And I think we're just going to get right into this. A lot of people looking forward to uh, you presenting on this topic, Jerry. So whenever you're ready, I will put your slideshow up on the screen as you're presenting. Okay. Take your time, Dr. Bergman, to the audience. We will be doing an audience Q&A after Jerry's presentation. So if you do have a question on the topic of human evolution or creation, anything on the origins debate, make sure to tag me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and we will have a a fun Q&A. Jerry, I'll recommend before you start, you'll notice at the bottom there, it says hide. What that does, if you click the hide, it'll just remove that bar 
from the screen and then that way the, there won't be if you go back to your powerpoint so you you were in the right if you go back to the powerpoint that you're at okay you're good you're good to go good to go okay this is about uh human evolution and it's a compilation of powerpoints i've done before i go to a lot of churches and speak to general audiences and a major concern is gee great lecture but hell i couldn't follow half of it or more and so i'm trying to make something really really easy to follow a lot of pictures and so this in many ways summarizes presentations i've given in the past one concern is is that the books here written by evolutionists are really expensive and i'm not sure why they well they, i guess they're trying to cover the cost but this book alone which i was wanted to refer to but it's cheapest found, i found was 298 dollars 99 cents and so i thought well i'll pass that one up but i wanted to look at it but i didn't uh, king james version says so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So biblically, we are all descendants, children of Adam and Eve. And Acts 17, 26, and he hath made of one blood from one man, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. So that's the scriptural orientation. And now I'll give you the evolutionary orientation. What most people are concerned with, just about everybody, is evolution of man not evolution of insects in this case but interestingly you can see looking at this chart here <laughs> you can see that uh instead of dotted lines they have lines down here and this shows you if you can see this my cursor on the screen this shows the beginning of the evidence for this family and the theoretical connecting points but all the connecting points are theoretical. The same thing is true with humans, except there is no connecting points that they have been able to determine with 100% certainty. So I'm focusing on human evolution. Adam and Eve there are in the Garden of Eden. And gross morphology differences. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of differences between a man, in this case, and the chimp, which is theoretically our most common ancestor actually common ancestor of chimps and humans is a animal which was very much like a chimp but we don't have that animal yet but that's what the theory says so in essence we evolved from chimp some chimp like animal profile same thing huge differences facial differences are enormous and of course morphology is external and of course, we'll look at the internal, the genetic differences as well in a few minutes. But when you look at this young lady and this chimp, huge differences. And some people say, well, this is a blonde hair. Well, not quite blonde, but blue eyed young lady. How about dark hair and dark eyes? Well, still a huge difference. And others, I've given this many times, by the way, I've done presentations in over 600 churches. And this one I probably presented, oh, 15 or 20 times. So someone said, well, what about an African-American? So I got a darker woman. And there we go. Still enormous differences between chimps and, in this case, a human. Now, there are examples that they use. This example, though, is a called a I have microphallic. That's wrong. It's micro, microphallic. Microcephalicism is where the brain does not develop. And so the facial deformity is obvious in this case, but this is not a normal person. This is a person suffering from microcephalic uh, disease. And it could be mutation, it could be due to mutations uh, or other factors. And again, we see the same thing. And this person is fully human, but he has a less developed brain. And so when we have enough cases of people to look at we every now and then find some that are morphologically similar but still obviously you would see this with a glance as a human and not as a missing link eyes enormous differences you'll see the whites of the eyes in the girl up in the top and the uh, brown eyes the black and, and brown actually 
for the chimp. So even in the eyes, we see tremendous differences. The skull obviously is one of the best examples. And we can see a human on my left side and on the other side, a chimpanzee. And this design, by the way, has to be this way because the flat face of humans is required to allow humans to speak. Chimps could not speak even if they had some of the organs that we have, which allows us to speak because they don't have the oral cavity that humans have, which is required to be able to speak. And then x-rays, you get the same thing, same differences, which are very dramatic. And again, we get a few humans that have some slight characteristics, but nonetheless, they are still humans. Brain size, a major difference. For the chimps, the brain is much smaller. For humans, the brain is two to three times as large as that found in a chimp. Human brain, 1378 grams. Chimp brain, in this case, about 399 grams. So you can see enormous difference in brain size. Speech is a major difference between humans and all uh, animals, actually. Humans are the only creatures that can speak. Speak referring to a language that communicates ideas, thoughts, words, and so on in a complex way, allowing speech and writing. Speech can, of course, copy or utilize words that are written down. And when we look at the speech area of a chimp and a human, we can see these differences are enormous, and these differences are all required to allow humans to speak. And then when we look at the air path passageway for food, and this is at the root of choking in humans, and people say, well, maybe we should have three different openings which are separate and not connected, as in this case they are. But on the other hand, this system, this design is necessary for us to be able to speak. One evolutionist wrote a chapter on this and said that humans have a problem with choking occasionally because of the similar route. You can see the connection there, the, the black line. The similar route that food and air goes into separated in this area right here. And this allows for choking. But they admit if this design was carried out the way they're suggesting, we wouldn't have to worry about choking. We just wouldn't be able to speak. And so this design is necessary, even though occasionally people do choke. And occasionally, that's true, they, people do, do die because of choking. But most choking, by the way, is due to uh, swallowing when you should be, I should say talking when you should not be swallowing. And so there are reasons, uh, drunkenness, drinking, really young children, uh, people who are not in full command of their faculties. So the vast majority can, of us can swallow, what, 300 million times in our lifetime, and the chances of choking are close to zero. Skeleton, again, we see enormous differences between chimps and humans. If you find a bone, almost any bone, if you have enough of the bone, you can usually differentiate the bone from a human and a chimp. So there's some similarities, certainly. But on the other hand, the differences are profound. And therefore, if you have a good portion of the bone, you can invariably tell whether it's from a chimp or a human. Jaw, again, enormous differences, human jaw and an ape jaw. And these differences, again, are required in order to allow speech to occur. Hands, you can see enormous difference here between a human hand, a baby in this case, and, <laughs> and a gorilla. Feet, the same thing. In fact, chimps have four hands. They really don't have two feet. Humans are the only creatures that have feet. The reason chimps have four hands is that they can climb trees. Humans cannot climb trees as effectively because they have two feet and two hands. Chimps have four hands, which allows them to climb trees much better. And this is a basic design difference we see between humans and chimps. Different locomotion, of course, bipedal for us, quadrupedal for chimps. Now, how do evolutionists explain the evolution of us from, in this case, gorillas? Well, what they do is they line up skeletons, and even this example taken from a textbook shows that gorilla right here, Australopithecines, obviously still very, very different. 
And so many of these lined up sets of skulls are showing a contrast and not a similarity. Although many skulls they find are fragments, maybe one, five, 10, 15% of the most of the skull, and therefore a great deal of artistic license is utilized in order to put them together. And one other thing which I notice is a lot of these drawings, like this is Australopithecus right there, and this is not taken from the skull evidence, it's a picture of a baby chimp. And I happen to have seen that picture in an old textbook, which is clearly labeled a baby chimp. And they've used that in textbooks for decades to show the primitive humans what we look like. Well, even this is a modern chimp, which I located, and you can still see some similarities. It's not as good as this other one, which was a drawing, by the way, in the original book. So you can still see some similarities between a baby chimp and humans. And it's not in time that the differences become apparent. And this is a good example. Chimp, you can see the facial traits are very different. A baby chimp, you can see they're much more human-like. So what we have to compare is not baby chimps with adult chimpanzees, but we need to compare uh, baby chimps with baby chimps and not with an adult, in this case, an adult. And we can see the difference here in these two pictures. The reason I use this is because it was in a National Geographic that was two, three years old. And I was amazed they stated the DNA profiles of these two are nearly 99% the same. No, they're not. And I would think National Geographic should do their homework and realize that that number is way outdated, like a decade or more old. Now we know the differences is not 99% similarity, difference of 1%, but we know the differences are 15%. And since there are 3 billion bases in the human genome, 3 billion of, or 15% of 3 billion is 450 million. So we're talking about a huge chasm between chimps and humans. 450 million base is diff, bases difference is enormous. How is this bridged? Well, evolution clearly teaches and has taught now for about 80 years, the difference is bridged by mutations. And I just listened to a tape done by a leading evolutionist, and he explained very carefully that the difference is bridged by mutations and gave a good history of how this idea came about. Well, we now know that by and large mutations are in virtually all cases harmful. Mutations cause cancer. And I did research in cancer when I was at the medical school. And clearly our concern is with what changes mutations make. And we know some details and we're learning more about the different mutations that cause cancer. So all inherited diseases are caused by mutations. So most birth defects as well are caused by mutations. Down syndrome, trisomy 21, of course, is a well-known example, but you have the Tau syndrome and Edwards syndrome and other syndromes as well, which are all due to, in this case, too many or too few of a chromosome. All other causes of disease, it's interesting, I've done this in front of several doctors and they said, yeah, you've done this quite well. All other causes of diseases are pathogens, diet, toxins, and I guess I could add accidents, which is not really a disease, but indeed, mutations are a major cause of disease, and there isn't that many other causes, pathogens, germs, diet, and toxins. And that's it. So mutations are well known. In fact, this book here, I have a cover of Encyclopedia of Human Genetics and Disease, shows all the diseases, about 5,000 now, diseases are caused by mutations, period. Ernst Mayer, a well-known biologist, he lived to be 99, actually. He wrote 10 books in the last decade of his life. He was a professor at Harvard University and one of the leading evolutionists of the last century. Wrote, I think, something like 50 books, was a very prolific author. Theodosius Dobzhansky, same thing. Except he said mutations is the only source of the raw materials 
and hence of evolution. In teaching biology, this is what was brought out over and over. The books would stress that mutations produce the difference between us and monkeys, and therefore they produce the evolution from our primate ancestors to modern man's. Now, some brief history about mutations. In the 1920s, Dr. Herman Mueller, very famous scientist, even today he's mentioned in the textbooks, who lived from 1890 to 1967, and he discovered X-rays increase the mutation rate in living organisms by about 100 times. And he used fruit flies and X-ray technology. And so he reasoned you could speed up evolution by causing mutations. And now we know today, of course, that you're not speeding up evolution, you're speeding up disease. But on the other hand, back then when he discovered this, he and other scientists basically said, aha, now we have the key to how evolution works. In fact, they stressed, we can speed up evolution. And this is an article in Scientific American, which basically points out that now we've discovered a way of speeding up evolution and we now know how evolution occurred. It occurred by the production of mutations. In fact, this discovery gave a Nobel Prize, and he wrote in his Nobel lecture, the accumulation of many rare, mainly tiny changes is the chief means of animals and plants of <laughs> improvement, but is how natural evolution has occurred by natural selection. Thus, he said, I bolded this, but he said this in his original. Thus, the Darwinian theory becomes implemented. So now we not only have proven Darwinian evolution, but we have been able to implement, cause evolution by speeding up the mutation rate. And this was, this idea was popular for several decades. And unfortunately, though, they realized in time that this doesn't speed up evolution, it speeds up the deterioration and the disease of the organism. Now, when I mention this, a lot of people say, yeah, this you're kind of exaggerating. And so I was going through a evolution for beginners book and a lot of pictures, very brief and several pages. I will quote from word for word, no mutation, no evolution. Pretty plain, pretty clear, I should say, conclusion. And they admit mutations are random random and beneficial mutations are rare. So how do we get evolution when these mutations are random and rare? Well, the problem is, is that 99.99% are damaging or close to damaging. They don't cause damage by themselves, but they add up and then they cause problems. So beneficial mutations, they admit, are rare. Less than one out of a thousand are beneficial, and these typically are beneficial by breaking a gene, allowing something to come out. It's like colors are made by putting together different colors, and you get various new shades, etc. So if you break the source of one additive color, you change the color, and many mutations change the color of animals by breaking a gene which produces part of the color and when that gene is broken that part is not produced and therefore the color from the other gene that's still there is shown and so many mutations are still damaged even though they cause some different uh, changes now mutation hotspots and working in this area spent well, years studying this stuff and one thing that we find is true is hotspots and this happens to be p53 colon cancer gene. So it's the P53 gene, the guardian of the genome, very famous gene, very fascinating gene, by the way. I used to love to give lectures on P53, but this happens to be the damage causing colon cancer. And when we analyze colon cancer, we find virtually all mutations are in what they call hotspots. In other words, let's say we have uh, a sentence here and mutations change the sentence, but they sentence over and over over the same words or parts of the words. And you can see here that like five mutations account for something like 90% of all mutations. 
So you're not going to get changes throughout the genome. You're going to get mutations in the same areas over and over. And this is important in cancer research because now we realize that colon cancer and other cancers are due to specific mutations. So when we sequence the cancer gene in your history or your family or you, we find that we get certain mutations which are common. And we determine what these mutations are. And now they are more and more uh, polarizing, uh, summarizing, focusing the treatment specifically on that mutation. So we have targeted cancer therapy based on the mutation that we find. And again, after thousands and thousands of uh, cells from cancer patients we've examined, you can see some clear tendency. So you're not going to get, even by mutations, you're not going to get improvement. All you'll get 99% of the time is damage in the same part. Now, if this was true, this idea of increasing the mutation rate was true to cause evolution. Maybe before you have a child, before your wife has a child or your girlfriend, next time you go to the airport, say, hey, could you put me through that x-ray machine? I'd like to get some x-rays on my gonads so I could get some mutations and maybe have a genius. My next child will maybe, or my first child will be really, really bright or really exceptional in some area. Well, probably the uh, workers at the airline will probably say, uh, could you stand here for a minute? I want to uh, I'll be right back. And they would chauffeur back two men, big men in white coats, and take you away because obviously they think you must be crazy to assume that mutations can in any way, shape, or form help your gonads and thus help your sperm and eggs and cause you to produce a superior child. It's not going to happen. Although x rays are very useful, this is one that they x rayed a luggage and they found a gun in the luggage. So that works out quite well. So mutating people, not so well. Now, one thing that I have many PowerPoints, I stress this because I, this is one of the major errors of evolution. And there's many slides. In fact, I have hundreds of slides that illustrate the same thing, but I'll just show you one. This is where they're able to schematize our genealogy. We evolved way back from lemurs then New World monkeys, and Old World monkeys, and gibbons, some eggs, orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas, negroes, negroids, australoids, mongoloids, and U Europeans. And this is really appallingly racist. And therefore, they did, and I have lots of pictures of this, but this is a quick way of going through it. They claim that the best evidence for evolution was inferior races, like Negroes. Now, I don't know what Negroids are. It must be some category, which I'm not familiar with. But Australoids, of course, Australian Aborigines. And Mongoloids or would be uh, Oriental, Chinese, Japanese, and so on. And so you can see how incredibly racist evolution was. And just a couple of pictures which show this. This right here is from a German textbook. The same thing is printed in the English edition, but I didn't happen to have a copy. And these are chimps, the German word for chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and N-E-G-E-R. And so no words, just this picture. When people look at this, it's pretty obvious what they conclude. Pretty obvious that this race of people, which we know is not inferior in any way, well, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. So these people are all our brothers, brothers and sisters. And so therefore, this racist picture is one of many which I have. And then you can see uh, chimps here and a young chimpanzee right here, and then a Negro, and then a, uh, this is actually Apollo. This is a Roman statue, and you can see the skull. And so they're showing evolution by the same, same means, from a gorilla to a, a Negro to a, evidently a white man, very racist. In U.S. textbooks, the many surveys by 1928, 375 U.S. colleges were teaching eugenics. 70% of high school biology textbooks endorsed eugenics. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the evidence against evolution, as I briefly said, is absolutely overwhelming. But why do people believe in evolution? Why is it so widely believed? Something like 99.9% .9 of all scientists 
except evolution. And before Darwin, 99.9% .9 of all naturalists were creationists. After Darwin, 99.99%, and you can quib quibble about these numbers, uh, the, the vast majority of scientists are evolutionists. So why did this change? This changed because of indoctrination in our schools. And these are a few examples. Uh, courts have ruled, and this is another problem. I've researched over 200 cases, and I found they've ruled consistently in all cases. And they've ruled that public school teachers must teach evolution as prescribed by the curriculum, meaning they must teach evolution as fact. And therefore, you're not going to get the information I'm going through now in most high schools. Hopefully, a Christian school, you will get this information. But the vast majority of high schools, even today, and back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the same thing was by and large true. So students learn one side. They're not introduced to the problem of mutation, the fossil record, etc., and the difference between us and chimps. Therefore, they accept evolution is true because they simply haven't heard the other side because courts have said you can't teach the other side. Now, what about Christian colleges? Well, I went to the University of Notre Dame not too long ago. And curious, I went to the library and in the bookstore, and guess what I found? In the bookstore, every book was either clearly in support of evolution or anti creation or anti intelligent design. So if you went to the bookstore in Notre Dame and wanted a book in favor of creation or intelligent design, you wouldn't find it. All the books there were opposed to creation and intelligent design. The same thing was largely true, although not 100% true, in the library. How about Wheaton College, one of the most well-known Protestant colleges in the United States, in Wheaton, Illinois, who I've been there. I've been there several times, giving presentations with the American Scientific Affiliation. And in Wheaton College, they do teach evolution tactfully, I should stress, but they teach evolution as fact. And therefore, even if you went to Wheaton College, you would be exposed largely or totally only to evolution. Now, I got, a, got an email recently, and the email basically wanted money. And they gave me a pitch, which basically they said that Every developing mind wrestles with the mystery of how we became who we are. Before Darwin, the only sensible answer was that we were designed by a supernatural creator. Now we know, they continue to say, now we know we evolved from more primitive life forms. But this complicated idea is not self-evident. It is hard to understand and what must be taught by teachers who have the knowledge, skill, and teaching aids to do so. In other words, it's not self-evident, and therefore you need teachers who are really good and able, therefore, to help students accept an idea which is not self-evident, which is not obvious. And they have an organization which they have teachers trained to help students accept evolution, and they know how to do this, and they know how to overcome the common objections like, gee, I thought we were design. We look designed. We look very different from apes. And you're telling me that we evolved from some ape-like creature? Well, the teacher is trained to overcome this issue. Now, others, in fact, when I go out and speak, I'm commonly told, well, what about theistic evolution? What's wrong with that? Accept the truth of evolution and accept the truth of the Bible. Well, Jerry Coyne, who is an atheist who taught at the University of Chicago, he wrote an excellent book titled Faith Versus Fact. And he points out, as he says in the title here, why science and religion are incompatible. And he does a good job showing very well, if you accept evolution, you cannot accept creation. If a page is white, you cannot argue that page is black. They are irreconcilable. They are answering the same questions by different ways. And then a book by Norman Geiser, who I had the pleasure of, he did one of the introductions for one of my books, but he said, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. 
I don't either. I can't see how people can believe, which is taught in the schools, which my textbooks that I use taught, that we are the result of the accumulation of billions of mistakes. Just it doesn't make sense. It's just not true. By billions of mistakes, we're not going to get better people. We're going to get a lot of problematic people, a lot of sick people, a lot of mutants, which are in the vast, vast majority of cases, not good. So evolution is faith based on belief, and I just don't have enough faith to accept that. Now, what do different religious groups believe? Well, this is a chart which I show in several of my presentations, and it shows basically that the shorter the lines are, the more people believe in, in these groups, believe in creation. And the line is shortest, and they're different colors, so you can separate the two, that those people who are Jehovah's Witnesses, ironically, have the fewest number of people who accept evolution and the greatest number of people, percentage-wise, that accept creation. The Mormons are next. Evangelical Protestants are next. But even the Evangelical Protestants, a fairly significant number, uh, accept evolution. Most of the churches I speak in are Evangelical Protestant or Historical Black Protestant. So the number there is greater. Muslims, which surprises me, are even greater. Mainline Protestant, over half except evolution, Orthodox even more, Catholic even more, and I'll mention why in a minute, unaffiliated even more, etc. Result of that's pretty obvious. This is a front page from the Bryan Times, which is the newspaper that is published in my area. And uh, I had a poll, and they, they mentioned the front page of this paper, less than half of Americans now are members of houses of worship. And I'm not sure whether they are celebrating this. I do know that they accepted my articles for 20 years. In the past year, they said, no more articles from Bergman. You have a hidden agenda, this cre creation stuff. And we, therefore, are not going to accept any more of your articles in our paper. And they haven't. And so I've had to go on and publish my articles in other papers. Now, when you look at the official position of denominations, and this is a survey done a few years ago. And basically, they accepted evolution as compatible with their faith. And of course, we're talking about human evolution here. So they accept human evolution and they somehow accept Adam and Eve. Usually, human evolution is how we got here. And then when we were evolving, God said, hey, I like that evolution going on and I'm going to put a soul in him. And then he will be a human being. This is what Roman Catholics teach. And Southern Methodists teach this as well. In fact, the intelligent design people wanted to put some films in the uh, a presentation that they were given in California in a conference. And these films they use run butterflies and, and uh, migration and so on. And the Methodist church there said, nope, you're not going to allow these in the presentation because... This is intelligent design, and this is controversial, and we don't agree with intelligent design. We believe that humans evolved. And then Evangelical Lutheran Church, yes, they accept evolution as the explanation for humans. African Methodist Episcopal Church, yes. Presbyterian Church, yes. The Episcopal Church, yes. Greek Orthodox. America, yes. United Church of Christ, yes. All of these, the official stance of the denomination is to accept evolution as the explanation for humans. And then, of course, a number of denominations say no. And these denominations, like Southern Baptists, National Baptist Convention, etc., are the more conservative denominations. And these are cartoons which illustrate that in many ways, as Eugene Scott said, I'd rather have two pastors testify in court for our side than four scientists. In other words, so many pastors and bishops testify in favor of the evolution position that courts are swayed by this and therefore apt to rule. You cannot teach evidence against evolution. You have to teach evolution as fact. And this cartoon says that, Pope Francis, science is the big book, and science is crushing creationism and television design. So that's the big bang there. It's a cartoon illustrating that. So indeed... The atheists and the evolutionists, and when I was an atheist, 
we recognized that one of the major sources we had of support was the big denominations. This is an article in the Toledo Blade, and they basically said, how do we end up with large useless body parts? Well, we evolved, and therefore, as we evolved, we retain structures that we had when we were less evolved. And they go into detail and they explain why we have all these useless body parts, tailbone, appendix, and so on. So I wrote a letter to the blade because this is simply not true. And basically in the letter, I said that I've written several books on this claim and I've taught anatomy and physiology for several decades and in evaluating textbooks for my class and the textbooks we use, none of them claimed any organ in the human body was useless or vestigial. All of them gave functions of all the so-called vestigial organs. So anatomists don't teach it. Why do evolutionists teach it? Well, one of my relatives, his anatomy book did not teach this, but his biology book stated we have all these vestigial organs, and this is the profound proof of evolution. And you can see the book uses organs here, which I took every claim and shown that all of these so-called useless organs were not useless, but indeed very functional. And that turned out to be one of the most popular books. And you can see this is the Arabic version. About a dozen of my books are in Arabic. And uh, I'm pleased that they have found my work, work useful. This is a film I did, Vestigial Organs from 100 to None. And this normally is not a topic that most people enjoy looking at. But the editors did such a good job on editing my presentation that this turned out to be one of the most popular uh, videos. This was done by David Reeves, Wonders Without Number video series. And so this is my explanation. I've taught a &P for three decades or so, and all the claims of 100 useless organs are simply not true. And I mentioned some of the functions and point out that indeed, this article is not accurate. It's not true. It's misleading. And I was hoping they would publish my article. I know they got it because they called me and said, or asked me if I sent that letter in to them. And I said, yes, but they never published it because, well, they simply do not want to present evidence against the evolutionary worldview. Even if they have to distort and lie and give information is wrong, it's okay because the ends justify the means. Now, a court decision by Judge Jones said, there is an assumption which is utterly false. This is his words. And that is evolutionary theory is antithetical to a belief in the existence of God. And that, the judge said, is clearly not true. Well, we know that's true because I have a book that I wrote showing that evolution is the doorway to atheism. And I have a book which covers many cases. And when I was an atheist myself, I talked to Madeline Murray O'Hare, which, by the way, I got along fabulously with. And uh, I asked her why in our atheist magazines we spend so much time on evolution. This is biology. Why not talk about how wonderful it is to be an atheist? And then she said to me, the reason we talk about evolution so much is because evolution is the doorway to atheism. And I never forgot that. And I named the title of my book after what she said. But of course, she tragically was murdered a few years later by some of her fellow atheists. And therefore, I guess I don't have to get permission to use that title. But that's anyways where it came from. So clearly that Darwin's theory was developed specifically to murder God. Why do people believe in God? They believe in God because, well, the evidence of their senses, the, the creation, the beauty of body of animals and plants and life. And how do you murder God? You do that by coming up with another explanation for the existence of life. And that other explanation was evolution. And his purpose was, in his words, it's like committing a murder. It was a little bit more tactful than that, but that's basically what he was saying. And that's basically what happened. And religion what we see today is that the courts have said you cannot teach religion in public schools, but in essence, they are teaching religion. What is religion? 
Religion is a worldview. It tells us where we came from, our purpose now, and where we're going, our future. So religion, Christianity, tells us where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Evolution also tells us where we came from, apes, our purpose in the here and now, survival, where we're going, when we die, we die, and that's it. And so, in essence, in the schools, we have an official religion and that is the religion of Darwinism or evolution. Now, when I say that, people say, well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I just quote Michael Roos, who is one of the leading scientists, evolutionary biologists, and he wrote a whole book defending what I'm saying. He didn't intend to do that, but in essence, his book is very well done, Darwinism as Religion, and did a good job showing, indeed, Darwinism is religion because it answers the same questions that religion answers. One of the main methods that evolutionists used, use is making fun. And you can see here is the fish and the monkeys and a primitive human. And, and then we have the Arkansas superintendent, Douglas, who basically is advocating teaching creationism in our school, at least the cartoon claims. So in essence, they're saying that we're science deniers. And we are denying the facts of science to accept the myth from the scriptures. But yet, indeed, as I have shown, and thousands of other books have shown, besides my 60 own books, that indeed evolution is not supported by science, but creation is supported by science. And here's another cartoon. And I have a whole bunch of these. I pick these because they're obviously so silly, but most are. Most are silly. There's a scientific creationist here to apply for the position of biology teacher, this uh, secretary says, and there he is. He's got an apple and a snake, and therefore he uh, is one. She's a creationist, and therefore he wants to teach in the school. Well, that's silly, obviously. And uh, it's so silly, it's helpful for us because it shows you the level of stupidity or ignorance that their cartoons show. And here we go. Billy wins his first creation science fair. Hypothesis, Darwin was wrong. Experiment, read the Holy Bible. Results, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Hypothesis proven. And there is, this is totally foolish. Uh, I can't even describe how it's just simply not true. I've never heard that from any creationists. Uh, in fact, creationists spend a great deal of time doing scientific work. And some of the work is very well done. As uh, Galileo has shown in his work, and Louis Pasteur and others have shown. And here, creationism in public classrooms. Here's the priests putting creationism in the head of the student. And in essence, what we have is, and I should get someone to redo this, and instead of creationism, put evolution. And evolution will be put in this poor student's head. And then over here will be creation. So I need to ask one of my friends if they can redo this. And I might have to worry about copyright issues, but anyways, maybe we'll just tweak it and get the same cartoon. So what we see today, why creation is rejected by many scientists and evolution is accepted by the vast majority of practicing scientists is I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. So you censor it. They only get one side and therefore they accept the idea of human evolution, even though the evidence is absolutely unequivocally without a doubt overwhelming against it. You are not the result of billions of mistakes. It's not going to happen. And we know that. And that's why when you go and have an x-ray taken, they'll put a lead shield on your body or the x-ray tech will push the button and run outside and then turn the x-ray machine on. And so we know x-rays cause mutations and we know they're harmful and we know they're not going to cause evolution. They're not going to bring about, except in very rare cases, any beneficial changes. And so that's it. That's a, kind of a summary of my mini presentations. I've got several hour-long presentations just on mutations. So there we go. Dr. Bergman, another excellent uh, presentation. I appreciate it. And this presentation really complements 
your previous, now you've done many presentations with us, but you've done also two, one on Neanderthals and uh, a general presentation on human evolution. And so this presentation complements those well. And, and therefore, I appreciate it. Now, one thing I'll say, I got a lot of questions here for you, as usual. We have a very uh, in, engaged live chat. I've also got questions of my own. But one thing that I wanted to mention before we get into the questions, Jerry, is you talked about the what I call the superhero protein, the P53. Oh, and okay. and I, I appreciated that. I've done a lot of research on that as well. I've written a book specifically uh, on endogenous retroviruses oh. and how they are not evidence for evolution. And I discovered that um, cancer researchers, they're actually working on drugs that will stimulate this P53 activity and the transcription of ERVs as anti-cancer therapy. And so these ERV elements that evolutionists uh, look to as evidence for human evolution, they're actually playing a, a functional role in tumor suppression through viral mimicry. And, and so basically when the cell is under sh stress, these transcribed ERV elements, they give the cell the appearance of being invaded by a viral infection, right? And as a result, this targets the cell more destruction by the immune system. And so although some tumor cells can evade detection by the immune system, this mechanism is actually mediated by the P53 protein. And so it's a way for those tumor cells to become detectable by the immune system. And that now uh, enables the immune system's ability to uh, clear the, those tumor cells from the body all through uh, endogenous retroviruses. Are you familiar with that at all, Jerry? And, and Somewhat. Jim, I'm about a decade behind. But I know over half, about 58, 60% of all cancers, the P53 is damaged. Mm. And so therefore, that's a key. Well, that's, the guy, that's why they call it the guard in the genome. And so uh, they were just getting into some of this research that you mentioned. And that is an excellent way of stimulating the, bio, the, the body, body when it still has a functional P53 right. to go into, go into action. Well, it's funny too, because I am, uh, I interact with evolutionists and critics frequently, and uh, we frequently discuss ERVs and th they'll ask the question, well, why do these ERV sequences, why do they share sequence similarity to some of these bad viruses, like an exogenous retrovirus, such as HIV, Jerry, I know you've done a lot of study on viruses because they have the same components, right? Your uh, LTRs on either side, your GAG, your pole, your ENV components. But just in this one function in viral mimicry, they actually require that sequence similarity to the um, exogenous retroviruses to carry out their roles, which, which I find to be, to, to be fascinating. So ERVs being one of the evolutionist's favorite arguments for common descent. Can you speak to that a little bit, Jerry? Do you have a, an overall opinion on, on that? line of evidence or well, first of all i agree with you secondly uh because we find a set of genes or a set of base pairs which are the same in viruses as in humans that doesn't mean that they came from a virus and mm -hmm. that some are no doubt virus viruses and uh one theory is, is that these viruses well one job of viruses in the world by the way is to move genes around they produce a great deal of genetic variety in the natural right. world and so it's certainly possible that they could produce some genetic variety in humans as well. And it's possible that certainly things may not work out quite right and they may produce some problems in humans as well. And so you have to realize that there's, there is an enormous amount of similarity between um, virus genes, bacteria genes, human genes, et cetera, because all these creatures do similar things. In fact, if anything, virus do, does a lot of the same things that, our genes do, but they do less things. And that's why they have to take over your cells and use your cells in order to reproduce more of the viruses. But viruses are the workhorse, as you know, in biochemistry, and we use viruses all the time to do our work. In fact, Lambda virus is one of the most favorite because it's a large virus. You can pull out a lot of the genes and it doesn't affect its operation. And therefore you can load it with other genes and you can use that virus to carry genes into other organisms 
And so it's, uh, we use that quite a bit to do uh, experiments as well as for various experimental type of therapies. Amen. So well, that, amen. Well said. Great points overall. Do you find it to be the case oftentimes, uh, Dr. Bergman, that when an evolutionist hears the word virus, it automatically invokes negative thoughts? But we understand that most viruses, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're actually good. They're beneficial to the environment. I have an article. It's a secular article. And I'm paraphrasing here. The title of it is more or less, you wouldn't want to live in a world without viruses. Uh, I'm glad you said that because I have a PowerPoint where I give on viruses. And I show that the vast majority are useful. And I explain the ones that are not useful are not useful because of either mutations or because some genes have been transferred, or you end up with a good virus in one place is a bad virus in another place. And so therefore, I'd like to look at your, you have to give me information on your, maybe I can add some slides to my PowerPoint. The reason I'm interested, of course, is at the medical school, we work with viruses a lot. Yeah. Only We only work primarily with a few types of viruses, which were the favorites in doing medical biochemical research. Well said, Jerry. Um, we have basically a hundred trillion cells in our body. Do we have more or less the same or even more of these viruses in and on our body too? Yeah, the theory with bacteria the theory is that cells, 90% of our cells are bacteria. And mm. uh, so you take the total number and you got 90% are bacteria and the 10% is you. And the same thing more and more is true with viruses. With viruses, the issue is, is that the vast majority are not harmful. Therefore, why research them? I'm collecting money to do research. And I say, well, if people want research in this area. Well, what, what for? Well, just curious. Just want to find out what this virus does. Well, that's nice, but we want to find out what viruses do that are harmful. And so, therefore, the vast majority of money is given to researchers who are researching viruses that are harmful and not those that are beneficial. Although if you research ones that are beneficial, you can often find spinoffs, which allow us to understand other viruses, et cetera. So it's not totally useless, but by and large, you want to get money for research. You have to show in the vast majority of cases, a practical application. You have to indicate that my research will find that this virus causes some problem more, or can help some problem or some other. And many viruses, we just don't know what good or bad it does. And right. Probably the vast majority are good because it was bad, we would find out. And so therefore, uh, it's hard to get funding and our funding is a major driver of research and therefore we don't know. But I'm curious, I'm curious as to what a lot of viruses do. There's supposed to be five different viruses in your eye and I wonder what they do. Mm -hmm. And we don't know, we just know they don't cause a problem but I'm wondering maybe they have a beneficial function. And maybe someone will find out someday what, what they do. I find the evolutionary starting point in worldview actually hinders scientific advancement because it assumes that most of these viruses, like you're saying, don't have a function. The model assumes most of the genome is junk. The model assumes a lot of these organs and structures, as you talked about, are vestigial. So it, it hinders the advancements of us actually uh, studying the genome, studying the um, physical body and finding out what these functions are. Do you believe a lot of the bacteria in, in, in and on our body are uh, regulating the amount of bacteria that we have in our body? Without the viruses, maybe the bacteria would um, go, go wild without that regulation. Uh, yeah, that's true. Viruses regulate the bacteria. Of course, many viruses do. Some viruses, especially the, the famous one that looks like a rocket ship, is very important in dealing with uh, bacteria, regulating bacteria. And other bacteria, of course, can regulate bacteria. And again, the vast majority of bacteria, 99.99% are beneficial. And that's why they're called probiotics. And of course, that's why we right. ingest foods that are heavy in bacteria, like yogurt, and cottage cheese, and different foods, because those bacteria are necessary for good health. Well, and, and I was a nurse for six years, so that's how I became fascinated with topics like this, is just working in the medical field like, like you, Dr. Bergman. And 
as a nurse, we would oftentimes tell our patients after they're done taking their round of antibiotics, make sure you take a round of probiotics because the antibiotics are killing your bad bacteria and your good bacteria, but your probiotics are going to replenish the good bacteria. And so evolutionists that think, oh, bacteria must be bad. No, bacteria is overall good, just like the viruses. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Doctors should mention that, but in my experience, they don't always do so. At least say, well, regularly eat yogurt when you're done with this. Right. This bacteria, silo, antibiotics. And then, right. Then, or yeah. some other source. No, I've got that same experience, uh, Jerry. One of my favorite papers, it's a 2021 paper. I can send it to you. It's titled Switching Sides how endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections. And so there's a lot of um, research being done now on how the pre-existing herbs that exist in us and chimpanzees that we even share in similar genetic loci as the chimpanzee, they actually act to fight off bad viruses that infiltrate the genome. And so they are like antiviral programs built in. And so should it be a surprise if we share some of the, those with the chimpanzee? Right. I agree. And uh, please do send me the paper. I'd like to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Jerry, I'm going to get a question in here. So you talked a lot about uh, mutation accumulation and the fact that most mutations are deleterious, they're damaging, they're disease causing. And even your so-called beneficial mutations, they're so rare. They're like one in a million, I think we discovered through Lenski's experiment and his research. And so a few beneficial mutations are frequently advanced by the evolutionary community. One of them is this. And so here's the question. What are your thoughts, Jerry, on the nylon digestion by bacteria example of a so-called beneficial mutation? Are you familiar with that? And uh, if I'm so, I'm familiar with that about 10 years ago. I studied it, so <laughs> I'm not up to date. But on the other hand, if I recall correctly, this is another example where you get a small tweaking of an enzyme and the mm -hmm. enzyme then will be somewhat effective in breaking down compounds that it normally doesn't break down. So you do have all organisms, you have a fairly large amount of variety and tweaking, which you can end up by uh, one technique can be changed slightly and it is useful to, to deal with some other problem. And so this is only one of many examples. Jerry, you're spot on. And so You've got a good memory, brother. Basically, from my study as well, is these bacteria and other bacterial species, they already uh, have the capability of digesting a naturally occurring compound that is chemically similar to man-made nylon. And so basically, the, the ability, as you pointed out, is yet another example of the pre-existing ability to adapt. And so not a true beneficial mutation. And so my question to you, when it comes to the evolutionists, they, they, these are the best that they have to offer. Can these kinds of beneficial mutations ever actually counterbalance the damage being done by the many thousands of deleterious mutations accumulating in genomes? Of course, unfortunately not. Although a lot of times we call these mutations, but there's a system built in where you have some flexibility. And that's why you have what seems to be a mutation. It may be a mutation, which allows an organism to do something else that it couldn't do before. So all organisms, of course, the best example, horses, cats, dogs, you have an enormous amount of genetic variety. Probably on the ark, you'd add horse family, one, two horses, dog family, cat family, and from these three different families, and there are many others, of course, we ended up with 500 and some different breeds of dogs, end up with all, almost 300 different breeds of cats. And I just watched a film, a nature film on cats, and it brought out that there are enormous variety of cats can live just about everywhere on the earth. They can live in North Pole, the South Pole, the equator, uh, very wet areas, very dry areas, mountainous areas, and so on. And it brought out that all of these cats evolved from, and they use the word evolved, of course, we would say they all came from because of the inbuilt variety in the original cat kind. And we see this is true with so many animals, but many animals, it's not true. And therefore, we, we tend to, with many animals, we tend to have one kind or two or three kinds, and that's it. Horses, cats, dogs are exceptional in that you have an enormous amount of variety in all these, which uh, allows us to do what we do with them. The dogs that can do perform many roles, the horses that can perform many roles, many sizes, 
Uh, we, our dog is eight pounds. We have a, our daughter's dog is 180 pounds, close to it. It's huge. And so you see that variety is enormous in certain animals. But they're built in with the ability to be to produce that variety. And my guess is we'll probably, when we're done, we'll probably get, because we have an off-breed, we have a mixture of two different breeds, and so we have a different, a totally new breed. So I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up with a thousand different breeds of dogs. Right. Well, in in the from the biblical starting point, God said to be fruitful and multiply. And so it wouldn't make any sense if God did not create, as you're saying, organisms, including humans, with pre-existing genetic variation or as some creationists call it, the design diversity hypothesis. Because if God created uh, the original kinds, let's say the dog kind, the cat kind, as with homozygous genetic spots with no genetic variation, we'd basically be re uh, producing clones. And so it makes yeah. sense to have that pre-existing variety built in. And doesn't that counter then, Jerry, one of the uh, evolutionists, the old earth creationists, they like to say, oh, creationists have to explain all these varieties, all these different species in just 4,500 years since the flood. But if that genetic var variations built in or front loaded, these new varieties can come about quickly in a post flood world. Isn't that right? Yeah, they say the difference between dogs is primarily nine different genes. So you take the mm -hmm. wolf kind and you compare that with all the other dogs roaming around the earth today, and you find essentially nine different genes can account for most of that difference. And if you think about it, nine different genes, you have combinations. You have mm -hmm. 81 different, nine times nine, of course, is 81. Plus these genes interact. They can, set, they can increase the effect of one gene. They can decrease the effect of other genes. And so with nine genetic differences, and there may be more, but this is the current estimate. With these nine genes, we get, as we see today, enormous amount of variety with dogs and, and with other animals. Same thing is true with horses and uh, cats. That's an excellent point. So the evolutionist, the evolutionary model would suggest that these genes and all of these DNA differences that separate different kinds of creatures, they came about ultimately through mutations. But you're saying that a lot of these genes or DNA differences came about through creation. And so just through recombination in a single generation, you, you shuffle those pre-existing genes up, like you said, you get new variety. It's built in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because and that's with people. It said that there's no people, no two people in the entire earth that are identical in every way. Right. And that's how they can use facial recognition, which hopefully they can be pretty accurate in that. But they can more and more recognize people by their facial differences. So even though there's a small number of genes that produce our facial traits, nonetheless, there's enough variety where it's pretty rare to find someone that looks even highly similar to you, let alone exactly like you. you know, well, that and is. That, that's a great point. Here's a critic in the chat. Appreciate our skeptics. Um, Lorraine Drosophilia is asking in response to what we're saying, why would a perfect being need to introduce imperfect variation? But my initial thoughts, and then uh, Jerry will get your thoughts, is I feel like the evolutionist is making that argument, assuming that this variation was built up through deleterious mutations over time. This, this pre-existing variation was not built up through mutations. It is, it's created, it's designed to result in in variation through processes like recombination gene conversion what are your thoughts jerry well you do have a number of cases of mutations like calico cats is a famous example right. used in genetics where you have a mutation in which the colors are affected by the temperature and therefore the temperature of the extremities like the limbs and the tail and so on are different than the rest of the cat because of this calico cat genetic mutation and the best example, I think, is a hairless cat. This is clearly a mutation, clearly doesn't have any hair. And I think they're ugly. But there are people I know who really think hairless cats are just beautiful. Now, I think there's something wrong with them. But on the other hand, there are people out there who like the hairless cat. And they, there's a certain market for that cat. But yet it's clearly a mutation. It damages something, namely the production of all hair. And as a result, not only they have no hair, but they have no eyebrows. They have no the uh, whiskers in front that helps them work their way through small areas. Those are gone. They have totally no hairs whatsoever. Clearly mutation, no doubt. 
But on the other hand, some people and some environments may find that been beneficial. So you can lose structures, and yet that can turn out to be a benefit in certain situations. Right. And so a lot of these artificially produced dogs, like domestic dogs, which you have a lot of experience with, Jerry, the uh, features, the morphological traits that we see in, let's say, pogs or um, chihuahuas are basically due to degeneration and a reduction in allelic variability overall. Yeah, a lot of them are. That's true. And again, we may find them useful or desirable for certain reasons. So it may be for us, for a certain person, a beneficial mutation. But by and large, many of these changes are not beneficial for the animal. Certainly a hairless cat is not beneficial. Can't survive right. quite as well in the wild. But in very hot climates, it sometimes can do better, depending upon the environment. So there is there is flexibility there and mutations can be part of that. No one says that no mutations are beneficial. We're just right. saying, as science has shown, the vast majority are not beneficial, they're harmful, and therefore they're going to swamp out quite quickly the beneficial ones. Amen. Amen. There, there's no way to counterbalance that damage or there's no significant trade-off. And so I think that's a great point. Like like your chihuahuas, you know, people have art artificially selected for certain traits. Mutations have been introduced. And now you have a chihuahua that's very cute. People love chihuahuas as, as a pet. But if you were to throw all the chihuahuas into the wild, they probably wouldn't last very long. The, the, who knows? They'd probably be prey for the squirrels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's some uh, more great points, uh, Jerry. Here's the next beneficial mutation that is repeatedly advanced by the evolutionists as a, a true example of a mutation that's really adding novelty. And so I wonder if you, you had any thoughts on this. And the question is, Jerry, what are your thoughts on the presumed lactose beneficial mutation? The mutation they, sa they say as evolutionists that allows us to drink milk, they say that that's a beneficial mutation. Well, from my understanding that we all have the ability to drink milk when we are born, and for a year or three after that. But mm. some people, the mutation comes along and we become, some people <clears throat> become lactose intolerant, but some people are not lactose intolerant, like I'm not. And that tends to be true in certain ethnic groups. They're lactose intolerant and others are not. And so therefore, uh, I would say losing the ability to consume milk is a problem. Right. Because if you, especially if you like ice cream and so yeah. many milk products, then that's that would be a problem. So I'm not yes. sure how they 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 claim that's a beneficial mutation because what happens is is we we lose the ability that's programmed in us to lose the ability to drink milk. That's because by and large, once you're weaned from mother's milk, from in most cultures, there's no need to drink milk. Right. But we like to drink milk because well, there's chocolate milk and there's ice cream and there's lots of good things that we yogurt and so on. So there's lots of good things we can make from yogurt. But that's not a major problem because we just swallow the enzyme and then we can drink milk and eat ice cream and so on. And you can just actually swallow the enzyme that breaks down the milk into uh, digestible parts that can be recycled. Right. I think you nailed it. So even that one's mostly reductive and we're mammals. And so we are born, like you said, with, with the need to drink and digest milk. I've, I've read that in the case of some people, they have a gene that basically stays on permanently. And so rather than the gene uh, flipping off after the, the baby's been weaned off the milk, this is a gene that, that stays on, whether it's through mutation, like you said, or whether it's epigenetic. I don't see how, again, this is the kind of mutation that's basically going to take your single solid like ancestor over time into a whale into a human, these macro evolutionary changes, uh, Jerry. Right. And as far as I know, all animals can drink milk for their entire life, or at least most mammals. I know mm. cats can. You can feed a cat milk until they are no longer alive. And so many animals that live off milk as infants can live off milk their whole life or can drink milk their whole life. And so therefore, although I'm not sure that's true with all animals, but with many animals. Right.
Very good. Very good, Jerry. So I know you've done some work on this one. This is another big line of evidence for evolution. When you do, when you look in, like, for example, BioLogos, you just go to these uh, prominent evolutionist websites and you type in what are the best lines of evidence for evolution. Typically today, you'll get what we're talking about, beneficial mutations. You'll get endogenous retroviruses, which we've demolished throughout this program, Jerry. You'll also get the chromosome two fusion. That's another big one. And I would say it's within the top three that most informed evolutionists will bring up. And so here's the question. Was there a chromosome fusion in humans, specifically the human chromosome two? And I've got it up on the screen for the audience to see as well. The result of chromosome, chromosomes 2A and 2. It's funny because the evolutionary community has actually renamed the chimpanzee chromosomes to 2A and 2B. That's how certain they are in their minds that this happened. And apparently these fuse together in an ape-like ancestor. Do you think the evidence is strong for that, Jerry? No, you'd have to have two centromeres in each of the parts that are fused. Actually, you'd have to have three. You'd have to have the original two plus another one, which mm. is more central as most centrosomes are. Plus, you have the problem where you'd have to have at each end, you have the telomere sequences and you have to have where they fuse telomere sequences as well. And there's a few telomere sequences where they're supposedly have fused but by and large, many telomere sequences are common throughout the chromosome. They're not rare. They're just unique in the in their repetition in the ends of the chromosomes. And you find there are functional genes in the area that's supposed to be a fusion site. So there are a number of problems with that, with that idea. And uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, of course, has done a lot of work on that. And uh, pretty clear that uh, that's not a viable solution. Amen. Great response. I've read your article series with uh, Dr. Tompkins. You both did fantastic uh, research there. And as you pointed out with the so-called cryptic centromere, uh, you know, we, we don't find the signatures for that. The telomeric repeats, as you point out, the TTAGGG, CCCTAA, basically the telomeric repeats and forwards and reverse. We find those all throughout the genome as interstitial telomeric repeats. And so the, the two key signatures basically of a fusion, they're actually uh, positioned inside two extremely important genes. And so the so-called cryptic centromere, that alphoid DNA, it's overlapped by a functional gene. And then uh, the so-called fusion site, the 798 base pairs, is also overlapped by a functional gene, the DDX11L2 gene. So the, the question I have for evolutionists, uh, Jerry, if you could speak to it, is how do you get highly functional genes by basically slamming together two chromosomes? I'm not sure how they respond to that. I find they basically ignore what we have to say. Mm. And it seems evolutionists themselves have to discover it. And then it will become mainstream in the evolutionary community. But it's like the vestigial organ argument. I have friends that say, you still write another book on this? Come on. This has been refuted by you and others <laughs> half a century ago. Why in the world are you still writing articles about this vestigial organ claim? I mean, that, the evolutionists are way beyond that. Well, they haven't. I have recent books that I just got a couple of weeks ago, which have the vestigial organ argument. So they haven't dumped it. It's still out there. It's in my grandson's textbook. They had the vestigial organ argument. That was a fairly new textbook. They're using in high school. And so unfortunately, why I'm not sure. I think, well, Gould was concerned about this. And he said the reason why was because when you write a biology textbook, you base it upon your own textbook you studied in school 20 years earlier. And you may have a specialization in some areas and you may add some information in your book on those areas. But on the other hand, the fact is, is that you're gonna reproduce pretty much ideas that others have talked about in other textbooks. And that's why Heckel's embryo, those are largely gone, but still you find books that push Heckel's embryos ideas, the ontogeny recapitulates by logic. Right. Yeah. And so there are a number of examples they just keep hanging on. And that's vestigial organs is one example. And uh, another example is the, the one we're talking about, the gene fusion theory. And of course, it goes against what they're trying to push. So therefore, they, they tend to reject what we have to say. and They're not willing to. So many are not willing to look at the evidence. I find it right. partially because they tell me with good reason, look, I've got to get grant money. I've got to do my research. I don't have time to read articles on the human 
chromosome fusion. I need to update my research. I need to hire graduate students. I need to supervise right. their work. I need to publish journal articles. I just I spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day doing what I have to do. I don't have time to. But the consensus is, and therefore they rely upon the consensus and not looking into these issues themselves. Great thorough response, Jerry. Evolutionary biologists, they're not going to go very far if they admit that their best lines of evidence, like the fusion, vestigial organs, <laughs> ERVs, they've been overturned and refuted, right? They're not going to get their grant money. They're not going to get to do their research uh, projects. And so they just keep repeating these arguments. And the newest argument to the chromosome two, basically as a counter to what we're saying, Jerry, and I wonder if you've heard of this, is your more informed evolutionist, I'll say like Dr. Ken Miller, who's tried to respond to, <laughs> looks like we, we got your puppy there. And so- just came home and wants, wants to know what I'm, what's going uh, yeah. on. <laughs> Well, I, I know your dog is a fellow young earth creationist and likes to get yeah, in on yeah. these dogs. So. <laughs> Introduce him last time. Yeah, he's always welcome, brother. And so the, the people like Dr. Ken Miller, who've tried to address our arguments, they've made the point that, okay, we find these interstitial telomeric repeats all throughout the genome. And therefore, they're not unique to the chromosome too. But they have argued, Jerry, but the chromosome two site is the only spot in the genome that we actually find the repeats in forward and reverse in, to, in a head-to-head -head fashion, T-T-A-G-G-G -G -G slash C-C-C-T-A-A. And so a good friend of mine, uh, Christopher Roop, who wrote the book Contested Bones, which I highly recommend, we took it upon ourselves to research that argument. And so I just put out this article. We, we looked into the genome to see if that's true, Jerry. And Chris specifically ran the BLAST analysis and we, we uh, falsified that argument. We found several chromosomes that actually have these repeats in forwards and in reverse. Specifically in chromosome nine, we found a large signature and I've got it uh, color coded here where we have your TTAGGG and your CCCTAA in a head to head array. And nobody would say that your chromosome nine is a, uh, an ancient fusion, Jerry. So oh, I'm not sure if you heard of that right. argument, but we've basically falsified it over the last month. <laughs> no, I haven't. And that's why it, he falsified over the last month. It'd be really nice if we could get this information out there in the scientific community, because they, I, I would assume they don't want to keep repeating things that are wrong. Mm. I mean, I assume if you show it to be, and you've done this by the analysis of the published genome, if you show their arguments wrong, I assume they'd want to know that. I want to know that. That's why my wife wonders what every article critical of what I've done, and there's been quite a few, every article critical of what I've done, I read because they might have a good point. They might be wrong in areas, and but they might be right. And so I want to find out. And the, the vast majority, 99.9%, .9 are simply wrong in their claims. But on the other hand, hey, that 1%, I'm looking for that 1% because I don't want to repeat things over and over that are simply not true. If right. It's not True, I want to find out, so I stop using it. And this is why this is why peer reviewers are good. I just had an article I sent in, and the peer reviewer found some mistakes I made. And I'm not sure why I made them. There weren't very. I think I was trying to skip some parts of the explanation, but it wasn't clear. And I, I told him, and he you know, asked me about the reviewer. I'm glad he found these mistakes because I can correct the article, and now when it's published, when it's out there. People are not going to find these mistakes and therefore will have less or no basis to criticize my article. Amen. And therefore, uh, I think we need to, I think evolutionists need to look at what we say because we are pointing out things that are, that are a concern. But they tend to, like Johnson said, they tend to circle the wagons and fire from the outside and become very defensive. And you can't get into the area there and you cannot give them information. They're just, they're not going to hear it. Amen. So well said. That's tragic. But yeah, to me, the research you did is, is uh, clear. And uh, I wonder if somebody who is not connected with our group movement, who's a, who's a secular, who could get that published. I would think that would be a good article to publish in, in any journal. 
Right. Amen. Yeah. I mean, me and uh, Chris, we we've discussed that because this is data that is, like you said, it's tragic that because we, you know, if if we had to correct something on our side or an argument we've been been using, we would be happy to do so. That's how we advance. And so you'd think that they on the secular side would want to do the same thing, whether it's vestigial organs, the chromosome two fusion. And so, you know, when the evolutionists first said that, you know, this is the only spot in the genome where we find these repeats and forwards and backwards. I thought that's interesting. I want to look into that. And, and we found out like a lot of their arguments that just isn't, isn't true, Jerry. I, I'd like to ask you a question and it's, it's a popular one because you did such a fantastic job in your presentation going over the differences between humans and chimpanzees. And so the evolutionists will oftentimes say, okay, yeah, humans and chimpanzees, those are extant great apes. But we fill in those gaps in the fossil record and they'll frequently point to, as you know, uh, Lucy or the Australopithecines. And so I'm curious what your thoughts on the claim that the Australopithecines had a foramen magnum that was positioned more closely to that of modern humans, but that they also have the angling that is more similar to that of a chimpanzee. And so essentially it's, okay, we have a position in terms of the foramen magnum that's like a human, but the angling like the chimpanzee. And so they'll, they'll say this is an example of a transitional feature within the fossil record and also evidence that your australopith your australopith types walked upright yeah my response to that is you're going to find some similarities between apes and us for many reasons and uh because there's a huge amount of variety in the morphology of humans and apes and so therefore you're there are what how many uh, primates are there probably several hundred and so out of those several hundred you're going to find some similarities that's doesn't prove the transition from one to the other, but it proves there are some individuals that have indeed traits in between humans and not many, but some traits between humans and uh, apes. On the other hand, so many of these skeletons, the skeleton fragments, which I point out in my book, Apes as Ancestors, so many of these are fragments and you have to assemble the fragments and that requires a great deal of artistic license. And therefore, it's hard to get all the pieces exactly where they were in the original animal. And it's hard to ensure that indeed you have all these pieces are part of one original animal. They could be parts of several animals or parts as they find parts of an adult and parts of a child. And therefore you get different parts mixed up that are not all part of the same individual or even the same age of the individual you're concerned with. And therefore you really have to be very tentative when you start looking at all of these fragments. And we cover that in, in detail in my book, Apes as Ancestors, I think. Yeah, do you have a copy of that? I hope you do, but it's the only book that carefully documents the chasm between us and apes and shows these links by looking at the detailed literature in the paleontology field by showing indeed that they, each of the paleoanthropologists critiques effectively the other theories and accepts their own. The other paleontologist critiques my theory and accepts his own. And so we criticize each other. And in the book, basically what we use is the criticism of each other and found in essence, all of them fall turn, turn dynamically short of what you expect to find in a, in a valid missing link, a valid transition between us and apes. And so therefore, they're problematic. Now, they believe evolution occurred. Therefore, yeah, I, I'm aware of the problems in your missing link, but mine is pretty good. My, I feel mine is valid. Your is, your <laughs> isn't, isn't for right. good reasons, but mine, I feel, is pretty good. It's better than yours. And then you'll respond, well, yeah, I've got some problems with your links, number of problems, but, but mine in, as a whole is better than yours. And so, therefore, they're condemning each other or criticizing each other on the basis of faults, which we basically concluded, they all are problematic. And there is no good example of a transitional form. But they would say, but I believe in evolution, therefore there must be, there, this must be a transitional form. It has to be out there. And therefore, mine's the best example, and therefore I believe mine is, 
is a valid example of a transitional form because I believe in evolution. So therefore the transitional links, they must be out there and we're just trying to find them. But of course we're saying that, well, they may not be out there. And therefore, if they're not out there, we conclude that indeed they're not out there. And uh, therefore it's easy for us to reject all the examples that they use. But again, if you believe in human evolution, well, they must be, there must be links in spite, right. of, in spite of the problems. They're going into the field of paleoanthropology, assuming that evolution is true, right. assuming that humans have evolved from ape-like ancestors. And so basically what you've shown in your book, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the field is contested. We have a lot of in-house debate, a lot of in-house competition, where some paleo uh, anthropologists like Lee Berger um, will look to one example and say, this is the perfect transitional form, but then other paleo anthropologists will disagree and say, no, this is the best exit. And so each find on its own is contested essentially. Right. And that's what we conclude. And because the whole field is so fragmented, as you pointed out, Jerry, wouldn't we require to make any real firm, confident conclusion on some of these, let's say, astrolopith types like uh, Lucy or Africanus or Anamensis and all these different um, examples? Wouldn't we need a large sample size, which we don't have? We have a lot of fragments. We have a lot of isolated finds. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. And that's but of course, again, they believe indeed that we evolved. Therefore, there has to be evidence out there. Mm. And my evidence, I think it's pretty good. It's not perfect. And yeah, you've got some valid points against it. But on the other hand, it's 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 pretty good evidence. Uh, from we as who don't accept human evolution, that's one reason we don't accept it is because we don't feel the evidence is persuasive. And we have too much history like Java Man and Piltdown Man and Peking Man and so on. They're all very problematic. And we look at that history and we figure, well, we see that some of the same problems with claims made today. And so therefore we reject, of course we reject for many reasons, genetic differences. There are a lot of reasons that we reject it, but on the other hand, uh, we, we point out the flaws, which they themselves point out. Right. You know, and I've even had correspondence with at least one paleoanthropologist who's a secular that did not, not a young earth creationist. And it specifically had to do with Australopithecus sediba, who a lot of evolutionists like Lee Berger say is this perfect transitional form or mosaic form. And at least two that I know of in the field have admitted that, no, this isn't even a real species. It's artificial. It's the accidental mixture of human bones and ape bones. And there's actually there's at least one significant paper by Ella Bean and Yoel Rack that says uh, sediba is not real. You got some bones here that are homo some here that, that are ape. So have you had any experience with that? And, and what are your thoughts on, on that position that some of these examples are actually just artificial, not real? Oh, that's pretty common. And unfortunately, I guess, unfortunately, in the field of paleoanthropology, there's a lot of bad blood yeah. and there's a lot of animosity going on because they, the evidence is so fragmented and it's, it said it's, 90% supposition and guessing, 10% evidence. So we take the 10% evidence, and it's very hard to get something that's really firm based on this small amount of evidence. And therefore, uh, and that's one reason why they make claims that, yeah, you've discovered this anthropological specimen 12 years ago. When are you going to release the fragments to us so we can examine? Right. And the claims are that uh, you don't want to release them to us because we may find your claims aren't quite as strong as you believe and therefore there's arguments and you have we have a right to see your evidence we have a right to examine your evidence well well you can't now because we're still working on doing our papers yeah but you've had 10 years to work on doing your papers come on let's get done and let's pass it on to other researchers so we can look right. at it. well come on we found it it's an important discovery and therefore we want to be able to make extensive evaluations of this and you'll get your turn just be patient well, and I'm glad you said that because I've noticed now, 2022, 2023, a lot of your evolutionists, again, the informed ones um, that actually have somewhat studied this topic, they'll say, okay, a lot of the um, hominin or hominid fossil record, it's fragmented. Lucy is fragmented. But now we have the little foot finding. But we still haven't 
had a lot of different people, different researchers, other than the discoverers of it that have actually examined it. So I wonder if you could speak or have if you have any thoughts on basically this claim that we have Littlefoot, who I think is Australopithecus Prometheus. And they'll say that um, Littlefoot was basically 90% complete. They argue that the bones uh, associated with, with L Littlefoot are better preserved uh, than Lucy. There's uh, articulation there. It's not just a surface find like with Lucy. What do we make of that as creationists, Jerry? What's, what's a good way to respond to that? Well, a problem that they have is that I have my theory, and I know you're critical of my theory. I know you're going to criticize it. And if I give you all my bones, I know you're going to find arguments which to you are persuasive to, to eliminate or to uh, castigate my conclusions. And therefore, I'm not anxious to, you know, to give it to you. At least I want to be able to keep my theory so I get more grants and I get more money from National Geographic and I can do more research. And then with more research, I may bolster my, bolster my conclusion. And therefore, I can see they have good reasons not to give it to their enemies or their critics. But on the other hand, I can see good reason the critics and their enemies want to evaluate the bones. And therefore, sometimes all they get is casts. They say, well, the casts are not, they're not the original bones. Right. And they don't say the original thing. So you can see the the paleontological wars are real. And you can, I can understand their sides, their position. And uh, I forget her name, but she wrote a book. Mor Morel, I think her name is. Mm. She wrote a book basically on the paleontological wars. And she talked about right. all the wars they fought and why and good reasons they fought. Because this is my turf and this is my find. And I want to milk it for what it's worth. And I want to get some more grants and get tenure. And my retire, retirement and become a member of this museum, a board of directors, etc. And if I give my bones to you to evaluate, how, how do I know? You might damage them. You might, right. you might not support my theory. So you can see that the problem is they have so little evidence and the right. evidence is so speculative and problematic. The best example, of course, is Lucy. And I think I did on your show, the, evaluation of Lucy and that's pathetic. Mm -hmm. So all the other examples are even worse. So we're going from pathetic to what's the word that means more pathetic. Right. <laughs> to pathetic to really even more pathetic. And I noticed their examples can't withstand time. Like Piltdown Man dominated for what, 40 years? Another 40 years, I think they had the baboon vertebra accidentally mixed in with, with the Lucy collection. So I'd be curious, you gave a talk on Lucy, you're right. And since Lucy is always brought up, Lucy has been brought up for years and years. We were talking about the foramen magnum that they'll say is transitional. They will also look to the whole pelvic region, right? The sacrum, the ilium, and they will say, and I've got a diagram on screen. So I wonder if you could speak to this a little bit. They'll also say that the whole pelvic region of afarensis is transitional and evidence that Lucy walked as a, as a biped rather than on all fours as a quadruped. Is, is that a, a good you, argument or I, you, I guess, how do we respond to the whole pelvis? When argument? you look at the pelvic dimensions, I spent some, some years as a photographer working for a studio and I was amazed. And you, of course you select a model to, to, to advertise what you're trying to advertise. But I was amazed, you have to look at these things when you're selecting models for the, the photo shoots. And I was amazed there are some women who just didn't have hips. They just didn't seem mm. to be there, which, you know, no problem if you're photographing hands or faces or something like that. But there are other women who had really wide hips. It was enormously wide. And that she would be a problem for modeling dresses and so on. So we had to be aware of this. And that helped me become aware of just in normal people, the hip dimensions are enormous, enormously different. And these are all females that we're, we're looking at. And they're all females. They all would have to have fairly wide hips to birth a baby. But if you can see if this variety exists in living women, certainly in fossils they find, you're going to have a huge amount of variety, which indicates some look more like chimp hips. Others look more like female hips. Others look more like a woman who's given birth to nine children hips and, and pelvic area. And so you see enormous amount of difference and you can't always 
tell by the, you can usually, but often you can't tell always specifically by the hip bones, whether they were human or ape, especially when so many of them are found their fragments and you got to glue them together. And of course the hip bone area, expansion, contraction of the soil can actually crack this. Mm. And therefore it's difficult to determine the hip traits when you try to put the skeleton together as they found with Lucy because the expansion and contraction can shatter this area of the body where many bones, the humerus bones and the, the phalanges and, and the metatarsals and so on, these are far less prone to damage because of weather and damp right. and dry conditions. But the hip structure especially is very prone to damage and therefore very hard to make judgments, to make good valid judgments in trying to reconstruct the fossils of humans or pre-humans and determine whether or not they could walk on you know, bipedally or we were quadrupedal. Do you believe as young earth creationists, we should lean more towards the position that says Lucy and, and other of the Australopithecine types were bipeds or should we lean more towards the position that says they were quadrupeds who maybe walked upright occasionally like the extant apes do today, chimpanzees, gibbons, and so on? I think they could have been walked upright occasionally, like as you said, chimps and other primates do today, but they primarily walked on all fours or primarily quadrupedal. And, and of course, that's a major issue that evolutionists have. So for them, it's very right. important. For us, it's, it's less important because we're looking at the whole structure. One problem with Lucy and all of them is Lucy, we have what, 23% of the skeleton? Right. And therefore, it's a very small amount, although we have fragments of such where you have 40%, including the fragments, but only 20%. And that's one of the most best examples we have of a complete skeleton. But so many of these skeletons, all we have is the, the skull or fragments. And uh, small fragments, very hard to piece together. And assuming they're all from the same person, the same time period, the same uh, area and so on. So it's very problematic. And they're basing conclusions on really small evidence. As it said in court, they'd never win a case. Right. Now, do you believe Jerry out of curiosity, for example, on the screen here, B is Australopithecus afarensis, the reconstructed hip. A is a chimpanzee pelvic region. Do you... Would you argue that the Lucy hip was erroneously reconstructed to look the way that it looks? Or do you think we have a valid representation of what Lucy's hip looked like? Well, what about C and D? What's what's the story on them? I, I believe those are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think other examples that they'd have like Africanus. It, it's tough to say because I even have an image here where we have Homo erectus, Neanderthalensis, and Hobbit, which is known as Floresiensis, that had the, the very similar hip, the flaring hip, which some argue is due to degeneration and pathology. And so how, how do we determine what is just a fixed normal trait for a species and what is due to degeneration? Well, when you only have, of course, one or even two samples, pretty hard to make generalizations on that basis. I would say when we have hundreds of samples, it's a lot easier to make generalizations. Looking at in the pathology lab, for example, it's very hard to make generalizations on the basis of one or two cases. And therefore, that's what they're trying to do. I think that as you be here, I don't think it's looked that way when you look at the total structure, because right. this looks like it's pretty complete. But from my recollection of the hip structure of Lucy, wasn't nearly that complete. And they had to assemble them, and that required some, some work to assemble them, what they thought was the correct way of putting them together. Right, because it looks like, it, especially in all the um, images that I've discovered in my study, right here's another one, Afarensis. They seem to represent the, the whole pelvic region the, the, the same way. And so it might be giving, as you're saying, it might be given a somewhat of a, an erroneous representation if it wasn't all found and there was some reconstruction that was that was necessary for it basically my big problem is evolution what is the source of genetic variety mm, we have yeah. to have a source of genetic variety mutations doesn't work and therefore 
there's just a lot of variety in the natural world. And this could be, you know, it could have had an ape that walked pretty much upright all the time. I don't see that as impossible. I think Australopithecine, that's simply a, a mosaic like a Plucto ducto platypus. So Australopithecine has been argued about for years by evolution and creationists, but I think it's just a unique animal that had traits similar to several other animals, like duckbill platypus has traits similar to other animals. And so there's what, 20, 18, I think, or 17 different Australopithecines now, uh, discoveries. And so just a unique animal. It's not a transitional form as duckbill platypus is not a transitional form. It's just a, a very unique animal. And I don't see any problem with that. We have lots of unique animals and it's just another example. So well said, well said, Jerry. A lot of variety, especially in the pre-flood world, the media post-flood world. As we start wrapping up, uh, time always goes by so quickly with you. I appreciate all the time you give us. You're a great blessing, uh, Dr. Bergman. A fan favorite, I'll say. We've had a very engaged live audience the entire time. What are your thoughts on some of the claims, even in the field of paleoanthropology, that go over how there's significant overlap even within your Australopithecus types and your human uh, types. And so some of these isolated findings, like I know a, a knee uh, bone that was associated with Lucy may actually truly be a, a human bone that's been misclassified as let's say a Lucy bone. Yeah, that's quite possible. And again, my whole orientation is, is we need evidence of a mechanism that produces evolution. When we have that, then we can be in a better position to argue whether or not these missing links are indeed links and, and what they are. And uh, it's, they, they, Darwin had a hard time trying to figure out the source of genetic variety. He couldn't figure it out. He finally came up with sixth edition of the origin book. He came up, of course, with Lamarckian biology, as scientists did for many years after him. So once they realized that's not true, they threw that out. And of course, mutations came along and they latched on that for a few years. But now we know that's not the source. So what is the source? So you need to have a source of the variation to argue that this variation is evidence of a transitional form. And of course, we don't have that. And so um, we can't be afraid of concluding, well, there might be some uh, humans that walked in all fours and walked upright as well. It's possible. I don't see evidence for that but that's that's one possibility and they have no explanation as you've put it uh dr bergman for the variation that we would say a lot of the variations front loaded it's designed but they want to say the variation was built up over time in the genome that was manifested obviously in the phenotype through deleterious mutations but as you've shown in in your fantastic presentation uh jerry that simply is not the case it can't be the case and so again uh, great program. I always appreciate the couple hours that we get to spend together. Uh, Dr. Bergman, I could talk about these topics with you all day. Your dog has been very patient. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but I'd like to give you the opportunity for some final thoughts, final words, if you had them. And again, uh, Jerry, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, I think we really, we need to get into the schools, the churches, the schools is difficult because of course they teach one worldview and exclude ours. But on the other hand, uh, at least churches. And I said, I've been over 600 churches and 90% are Baptists and Church of Christ, a few, and uh, I think one or two Lutheran churches. But by and large, we need to be able to get into other churches. And again, I have yet to encounter any opposition in presentation my presentations it's almost totally favorable and the most common argument is is yeah all the science i get lost you just that's why i did this last powerpoint that i did on this show is because i'm trying to get a powerpoint that doesn't lose anybody that they can right. understand my points without going through a lot of information and details and so therefore i'm trying to get into more and more churches fortunately i get in about two a month and uh, it's hard to get into too many because i've got to spend time writing and I have to spend a certain amount of time doing my writing work. But on the other hand, I need to get into more churches and uh, do my presentations and uh, get some feedback. I think the only way we're going to change society is through the churches. And for unfortunately, the churches are on the side of evolution by and large. And this I see as tragic. I'm an 
background is Methodist, and just last week we voted to disaffiliate from the United Methodist denomination and go on our own. And many other churches are doing that as well. And the whole problem is they lost the acceptance of the infallibility of the Bible because of the acceptance of evolution. And the whole book I wrote on this, on the Methodist Church basically, shows that once you accept evolution, the whole edifice of Christianity falls. And many try to retain part of it. But on the other hand, it becomes difficult. Many, many realize it's difficult. And that's why you have so many that leave the churches. And that's why you have attendance now. The churches is less than half the population mm. because they just, that's, that's the link pin that basically destroys Christianity. And so now that's my concern is the science. But on the other hand, I realize a concern of many people is the effect on the church. But my concern is the effect on science. And these evolutionary ideas have caused enormous amount of harm in society. In fact, I'm doing a book now, which I talk about how important evolution was in the Holocaust. Evolution was not only important, but it was central. And I point out, given a choice of winning the war, World War II, or killing the Jews, they clearly made the choice, killing the Jews is more important. So we may lose the war, but at least we have got rid of the Jews, and they made it very clear as to why. The Jews are an inferior race. The Germans are the higher evolved race. The Jews and the Slavics and so many other groups, the Poles and Chinese and Japanese and so on, are all part of an inferior race. And therefore, to help mankind, we've got to eliminate all these inferior races, which was three quarters of the world's population. So uh, they made this very clear. Uh, a lot of books that document, indeed, why uh, the killing the the Jews and, and Slavics and other groups was more important than winning the war. Given a choice, they chose lose the war and kill more Jews. And uh, that turned out to be tragic. And that's why they invaded Russia and Ukraine and Poland, because there's a lot of Jews there. That's why they really realized they're not, why bother raiding Great Britain? They don't really care where they stand. There's not many Jews in Great Britain. So they focused their energy on the East primarily because that's where the large amount of Jews were and gave up basically just bombed Britain a few times and thought, hey, we're wasting our time here. There are not many Jews here, so what's the point? And so they moved on to, of course, Poland and, and Czech Poland and the Slavics, Yugoslavia and so on, uh, primarily, uh, primarily Russia and Poland. And so tragically they, and that's when they began to lose the war. They were doing pretty well until they invaded Poland. In fact, they're doing very well until they invaded, invaded Poland. Historians say they should have stopped. Stopped with they had most of Europe, was under German control. They had basically a united Europe run by Germany. Just stop. The big problem was invaded Poland, then Russia, and then they lost everything. And they could have been the most powerful, unequivocally, nation in Europe if they just they took over Europe and stopped. But no, they didn't stop because they had to. They had to get the Jews, and most of the Jews, many were, I, majority at least in Europe, were in, in Poland and Russia, and Latvia and Estonia and the other countries. So that's why they, they lost everything, for that one goal. So I wish Hitler's goal was to conquer the earth, and that's all. <laughs> but that wasn't his goal. His more important was, to get rid of inferior races, and he made that very clear. And others, historians have made that very clear how important it was. And uh, anyway, I just find that's tragic. But of course, now we have the EU and the EU is basically United Europe ruled by Germany. So they've achieved Hitler's goal by not peaceful means. So now basically the EU is the most powerful, Germany is the most powerful state in Europe. And they basically rule the rest of Europe. I understand at least. So maybe some of your historians might... Uh, come back with that but uh that's my understanding of, of uh the war so well, i think that's why your your writings your articles your books especially on that topic are are so important just to see how uh, tragic exactly what, what you're talking about is and i've got my moderator in the chat appreciate it right here is a link to your website the more presentations you give, the better, uh, Dr. Bergman. These are important talks, important presentations. The Q&As like we do here are important as well, where the audience can engage. 
I've also got links to your books here. So, uh, specifically this one, Evolutions, Blunders, Frauds, and Forgeries. I've got a few of your books here too in, in front of me in person. So there's your C.S. Lewis one. You did a whole talk with us on C.S. Lewis. That was fantastic. Uh, Fossil Forensics. And your newest one, which I think is comprehensive. You touch on a large number of topics in this one, Jerry. The Three Pillars of Evolution Demolished. And so here's just three that I at least have with me that I highly recommend uh, people check out as well as all of the other presentations and talks that you've done with us, Jerry. I'm going to sneak in a bonus question. I did miss this one. I apologize. This is from my chat moderator here, Doki Doki. Just a quick uh, bonus question as we wrap up here, Jerry. Um, he asks, is it a neutral position to say there may not be good evidence for human evolution today? but give science more time to advance to make more discoveries than maybe we'll have the evolution. <laughs> Jerry, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is commonly expressed. Whenever I bring up some of these problems, they say, well, come on, Darwin only published the origin of species, what, 150 years ago. And therefore, hey, give us more time. I mean, it's just a new idea, new field. Just give us more time. The problem is, as I show on my web website, as we have more and more time, we find more and more problems it doesn't make a better case. It makes a worse case. And that's why evolutionists are, are, are angry at us. And that's also why creationists love certain magazines like Science and Nature. When Nature comes out with a new article like they just did last couple of weeks ago, creationists are all abuzz because that article showed indeed our worldview, our way of looking at the world is correct. And therefore, more discoveries are not helping evolutionists. They're hurting evolutionists, and that's been the historical experience for 150 years. Darwin had a lot better case back then because we know a lot less, knew a lot less back then. As time goes on, his case gets worse and worse. And that's one encouraging thing about the whole creation movement is that evidence moves in our favor almost consistently. And therefore, as some people, my friends say, it's a great time to be a creationist because just when these, like they just discovered a new organelle and uh, the cell has now become more complex. We've got a new organelle, new, new complexity to the cell. So instead of less complexity, research discovers new complexity. And my prediction is that's what's going to continue happening. We'll get more and more complexity, less and less likelihood of evolution because now we've got another organ that got to figure out how it evolved and how it came here and why it's here and so on. But creationists don't have to do that because, well, it's part of God's creation. Well, I think, I think you nailed it there. We need lots of time. That's why I like to say time is the God of the evolutionist. More time, we'll get more evidence. Lots of time for mutations to accumulate and new structures and organs and novelties to evolve. And lots of time for single south like ancestors to evolve into all of the life we have today, uh, Dr. Bergman. So lots of time is typically the answer from the evolutionist. So again, fantastic responses uh, today, Jerry. I look forward to having you back on. I think this was more, I think, about the sixth time here on, on the program. And uh, I always have a blast talking to you about these topics. So God bless you. I appreciate you responding to our bonus question and also your final thoughts and final words. So uh, to the audience, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions, the feedback, and please share this content around because the, the truth is important. Jerry, as you put it, it's a great time to be a creationist. I should do my mutation presentation next time. That sounds great. That's I look forward to having you back on, Jerry. We'll communicate. And I think uh, a presentation specifically on mutations is, is a great idea. So, okay. Jerry, again, thank you. God bless you. God thank bless you your much. dog. I hope your dog uh, learned a thing or two. Oh. And to the audience, we're, we're tuning out. God bless. I'll have to take him for a moment.